for the review and the extension of the ambulance contract with action and prior to and during the January 25 committee meeting, the BOS advised that the committee's responsibility regarding the extension was limited only to a recommendation whether to extend or not. Further, we suggested the committee could not get into the financial of the contract. The actual extension and contract value would be handled by BOS. Ambulance committee met on January 25, 23, 25, 2023 and voted four to one to extend the ambulance contract. Now the committee has been asked to review language for an amendment to the contract extension. Tonight's meeting is to review the amendment's suggestions received from Craig Rivas, BOS member, on February 14. The committee can provide recommendations and express opinions, but cannot bind the town. Please re be reminded that this is a contract extension for a contract expiring June 30, 2023. It's not a negotiation for a new contract and changes might impact pricing. So let's just level set where we are right now. It's stated by the- I, I just jump in, because you said earlier, and I just wanted to correct it. We voted to recommend to the Board of Selectmen the extension we didn't vote to extend. Right, okay. we voted for a recommendation. So our, our, our responsibility is limited only to a recommendation. Okay. And we voted. And we voted four to one to well to recommend to extend the ambulance. Yeah, contract. yeah. I'm just asking. To... So I just want to make sure that as we get into this well, meeting I'm, I'm tonight, you, that I'm, we I'm are... listening, okay. listening carefully, and following you. I okay. just want to make that so, correction. This is a contract extension for a contract expiring June 30. It's not a negotiation for a new contract, and changes can have impact to pricing. So to level set where we are before we get into the suggestion. As stated by the BOS chair at the last meeting on February 13, it's the intent of the BOS to extend the contract. And you can see the video recording at 27.10. 27 minutes in, 10 seconds. The suggestions made by Selectman Rivets are his opinions only. They're not recommendations of the board for a review by our committee. The BOS has not voted on or agreed on any of them. Um, we're looking at Craig's email and the request for consideration that was sent on the 14th. Adding use of the fire department ambulance as backup in the contract is far beyond the scope of the ambulance oversight committee and this exercise and therefore we can't consider it. We can certainly, dis I guess we can discuss it if it comes up, but at least at the onset, that's, I thought we were limited to not discuss that. It's solely the responsibility of the Board of Selectmen, which is not discussed or considered the many contract, regulatory, and cost issues surrounding implementation. And if, if and only if that were the Board's decision regarding future direction. So getting now to Craig's suggestions, section. Do you want to say something? Sure. Okay. Since it was stated at the last Selectmen's meeting that the selectmen were going to extend the contract. These are just personal recommendations. I, I move. I don't even want to waste time going over them. They're absolutely ridiculous. They're somebody's opinion, and uh, they're unreasonable. And they're the dumbest things I've ever ever heard. Obviously, he knows nothing. Craig, sorry, no offense, but about how any of this works, about training, these are unreasonable. Putting in the fire department ambulance that's 32 years old as a backup and taking away from runs made by action, which would decrease any chance of getting any of our money back in the rebate, I mean, it's just ridiculous. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It is a personal agenda by two of the selectmen to get the fire department to run the, the ambulance full time, again, which is the dumbest thing I have ever heard personally. You're talking about the taxpayer paying millions and millions of dollars for a service that will not even be equal or better than a professional service that we have for a minimal amount of money with a chance to get money back. The whole thing is ridiculous. I move we end discussion right now and they've already said they're gonna sign the contract and you guys wanna pursue it more, you'll have a fight on your hands because all the taxpayers that I have spoken to, which are many, 
are really upset. This whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. It's the same fight that we've been having for four or five years when you first started. Any other bids that came in were $750, a million dollars. Action provides an outstanding service. The residents are absolutely happy with it. It more than meets the needs and takes care of the needs of the town. And honestly, it's uh, starting to be an ethical question about why this is being pushed so hard. And uh, it's upsetting to me and a lot of people. So that's what I vote. I don't even think it's worth discussing. I read part of it and I didn't even bother reading. It was just a waste of time. So that's my say. Thank you. Do we have a second to Robin's motion? No. no. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, I do think that we should look through the administrative things to just. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You know, at least see where we are. Five million dollars. Five million dollars, or you want to pay three hundred thirty to get right. some money back? Yeah, but you, you, but you, you, preface, you preface this with uh, it's not in our purview to discuss tonight the. Um, possibility of a fire department ambulance. That's not what we were told we were I have show. been, we have no, discussed no, 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 a lot of things and I just you, let it go. You, you, said, you said we were not attached to that tonight, so I would say that whole thing, I, I appreciate your, your input and your passion on this, but it's, I don't think it's something that we discussed tonight, and that's why I didn't second it. I think we do need to discuss the remainder of this. But these are these are somebody's personal uh, opinion that the board has so, already so made a decision. Well, I think it, that... Let, let, me, let me counter that also. The board, at the last meeting, one member of the board, Donald Davenport, made a motion to um, extend the contract with Action Handbook. That was not seconded. There has not been a decision. The decision was to ask the committee to come back and review the language of the contract that every everything was could be put on the table with regard to the language of the contract and that doesn't include the contract does not include the um, potential for fire department ambulance so I, I, I agree with you the fire department ambulance is not part of tonight's discussion but well, the rest of the contract it is, is part of the let suggestion me, so. let, me, let me finish um okay. you preface this Donna with the fact that having this discussion would impact pricing or could impact pricing mm -hmm. we have a contractual agreement with action ambulance that we can choose to extend the contract mm -hmm. they have given us numbers for that um what is on the table tonight is discussions if if action chooses to change the pricing based on the discussions right then we can just reject it and go back to what we already have we are not uh, not we it would be the selectmen will do that discussion we're just making recommendations but the selectmen say okay we'll just go back to the original language of the contract and we'll change nothing they, have, they still have that option. So, so let's not play these kind of word games about what's going to happen if we have any discussion at all about the content of the contract. Well, the, the point that you're making is that we've been asked to look at this, but it's out of our purview. So if it's out of our purview, why should we even entertain discussion, right? It's not part, but of, I it's think not part of our purview within the contract that exists with Action Anchor. I think, correct. Exactly. But we've been asked by the Board of Selectmen as a nominated, as a, uh, nominated committee to um, make recommendations on the language of the contract. And then the Board of Selectmen would have that discussion with Action Ambulance. And I certainly would. I, would, I certainly would welcome the action ambulance's input tonight as we have discussions. But there are elements of what has been discussed at the selectmen meeting, and elements that, uh, in what Craig suggested, exclusive of the fire department ambulance, that I think are deserving discussion. And I agree with you. Okay. And I, that's what I said. I think we can go through and discuss the administrative things, the things like that. Um, but in terms of you know, deploying a Hamden ambulance as backup. I think that's a bigger, broader discussion with lots of cost implications, safety implications, and everything else. So when we get that far, we can discuss I, that. I, I don't intend to discuss so, that tonight. I, that's, that's, that's a that's an entirely well, different discussion. I it's on the list. It's, it's on the list. list. It's, not, it's not on the list. It was suggestions given to us by one of the members of the Board of Selectmen. 
So if we if we just say you know we, that that's not part of tonight's discussion, yet, that part of it's over. Well, that's what I've said. Okay. So let's so, move so, on. So right, let's agree on, that we're not going to discuss the police. So the, the fire department. What is in the contract here that actually has contact? That well, let's do to discuss. Why don't we just start at the top and take these one by one and see where we go? Because we can go in a circle all night long, and we really need to move forward. Okay. Scope one. Fire chief listed as primary designee where police chief is listed. The police chief should be listed as the alternate and then throughout the document. The fire chief is part-time, 20 hours a week, and is employed out of town. The police chief is the emergency management director and responsible for public safety. Police chief is full-time, full -time, available 24 hours a day, and the responsibilities include like coordination of police, fire, EMS, public works, response to disasters, regularly meet and discuss any pending and projected emergency issues with town stakeholders, and et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Therefore, um, it's my opinion anyway, that the action EMS contract for operational responsibilities should remain with the police chief. I second. I agree. I, there was uh, communications with Donald. I, I, this is the first I've seen of this stuff. I don't know if you're watching the meeting. This is the first I've seen of the email that you sent. Um, I, unfortunately, I was working all day long, and this is dated uh, 10, 10 42 this morning, or 11 42 this morning. Um, he brings up points with regard to the police in terms of the police chief would be staging the ambulance during public events. Because there's a safety officer. There's other things in here where he brings up that the police chief is the um, proper authority. Mm -hmm. But the I, I believe that there are areas in here where the fire chief yes. um, and public safety and, and they're, they're involved in, in in emergency response as well. There are areas where the fire chief would be the better designate. I disagree. I disagree wholeheartedly. Our police chief is full-time, he is in town, he has 24-hour responsibilities, and I believe that he should have continued oversight of this. And if any changes should be made with regard to the police chief, there's one instance in the current contract where it mentions the fire chief, and I think if we're going to pursue an amendment that that should be changed and and update and correct whatever to fire chief. I mean, please chief. I agree. He is the emergency manager director. So it's his full responsibility. Right. As part of his contract, that's his role. Emergency management is different than first response. And firefighters are firefighters. Our fire 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 first fire response, and they're usually first at the scene. And it's been that way. It's my understanding that it's been that way for a good long time. And unless there's, you know, real reason to switch, which I've yet to see, it's my opinion that this contract and the extension thereof stay with the police chief. Then I would amend your motion to uh, say that in, if, if we do that, that the police chief has to take on the full responsibility that is in this contract. If nobody's taken on the responsibility of reviewing the 10 minutes and greater and making a recommendation as to whether or not that was a um, un, um, you know, unforeseen circumstances, whether or something that prevented them from doing it, or if it was something that should be subject to a, a penalty that's in the contract. So I would say that if we give all that responsibility to the police chief, if, we, if we're recommending that, mm -hmm. and, uh, let's make sure we just say we're recommending that, then we also recommend that the police chief carry through with all the duties that are enumerated in the contract. I can agree with that. Just to clarify, the contract says that uh, a report of uh, uh, taking more than 10 minutes should be reviewed and that uh, a determination should be made as to whether or not the uh, extra time or the, uh, the additional time uh, was caused by traffic or by weather. And after that, if in fact 
those are not the causes, then there's an option uh, to impose a penalty. That's correct. And as, yeah. far, as far as I know, there's never been a review of any one of those where there was a recommendation to not take action or take action or to, or to, to, to impose upon. And I'm saying the contract says each one of those is an incident that needs to be reviewed. And then if it's the police chief's responsibility, then we should expect that the police chief. Yeah, we are getting the reports. I think what you're saying there is that. Uh, we haven't had the reviews there's, there's no action taken on locally no, and no we should uh, that we should uh, see to it that that happens and i can agree with that and and i can also agree with that uh, perhaps the email distribution should be updated and i i don't know you know to include police fire three board of selectmen and of course the town administrator now let me ask you mike my understanding is as you're going through your reporting um, and you're reporting enhancements, you're going to be updating, you know, and researching the greater than 10 minutes and all of that, and you might be including weather, and can you give us an update on that? Yes, yeah, so uh, for the last quarter of 22, we have been looking at the data and we've been updating the data, and uh, we've implemented processes to do a data verification process on our overnight shifts, and that data, that data verification process utilizes GPS tracking on the vehicles, so it becomes a completely accurate system and takes out the error in terms of that data. And as we instituted this new system since 1-1 of January, what we have seen is those response times going over 10 minutes and precipitously falling, because primarily there have been data entry errors and concerns. So year to date so far, we have one time that's in excess of 10 minutes out of all the calls that have been done in the first, you know, 45 days of the new year. That one extended response time is a result of the truck responding from a hospital in Springfield back into the coverage area to pick up the next call as well. So at this point in time, we have not factored in weather. We expect within the next 15 days, we're going to have the ability to factor in poor weather days on top of that as well and report that as well too. So, um, we're pretty pleased with the system in terms of the data side of it. We've done a lot of work um, behind the scenes to get that, to get to this point, and the data is looking much more aligned. So data from 22 that shows excessive response times and most likely data entry issues, weather issues, and or responding back into the town from going out to Wilbraham or other outlying towns that we might have been canceled for or coming back into the town from uh, a Springfield or other hospital in the area. So um, the, the, the improvements on the data side and the system side are starting to show through with the work that we did during Q3, Q4 of uh, 22 on this. Okay, thanks. This whole changeover from, action, uh, from AMR to action was motivated by response times that we were seeing that uh, Chief Farnsworth brought to me and to the selectmen, 20 and 30 minutes and, and more. And so the essence of what we care about most is response time. Contract says 90% of responses should be eight minutes or less. We have, we have the information that uh, responses average five minutes and what, 20 seconds. So, um, I, I want to add context. tightening up on the 10 minute, 10 minute response to that process. What's that? I want to add context to that. It yeah. was added by John Flynn at one of the selectors meetings. Yeah. And those half hour response times, those that they were totally unacceptable, were after East Long Meadow yes. started doing their own Correct. ambulance service. Yeah. Prior to that, yep. the AMR at no cost to the town stationed an ambulance close yep. to the Hamden border uh, between East Long Meadow and yep. Hamden line. And the response times were, were good, not as good as we're seeing now with the, yeah. with, with mm -hmm. the for service, yeah. but they were good. So let's not use that half hour response time as the basis for our conversation because that was an anomaly in a, in a year yeah. time frame where, you know, where yeah. we had a situation where AMR was no longer in East Long Meadow. They were unable to provide yeah. us that for free. I don't disagree with that. I think that it was the change in East Long Meadow. Right. That had the downstream problem for for Hamden. It so. was that change that precipitated yeah. a result, which caused us to go out to yeah. bid 
for a new ambulance. I'm not dismissing that. I'm just saying okay. don't use that as the basis for this whole conversation on response times because prior to that, response times were better than that. Well, and, if we're gonna, and if we're going to talk response times, we should talk response times from time of call until the ambulance arrives on site and not subtract the shoot time. That, well, that's that later number, in our conversation. You know, that that so number that's coming that out. Well, 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 listen, there's a lot of public misinformation out there that has me are upset. Okay? And, and there was not a 40% improvement in AMR, AL, ALS versus DLS in the month of January. That's public information that was put out in, a, in, a, um, in, in, in the newspaper. There, our response time is not five and a half minutes. It's closer to seven and a half minutes if you count the way the response time is should be recorded, which is from the time they get the call until the time they arrive on site. Right now, the response times that we see in most columns are the time they leave the site or we, you know, we get in the ambulance and go until they respond. So let's have truthful discussions. Mike, what's your thought on that? So my data is showing that we're, we're assigning the start. Of, our, our problem is, is that we aren't always notified of the call until it comes from the rack. Right? And the rack is handling the call. So whatever system you have and whatever's going on from that side of it, that's not within our control. Okay, so we're moving the truck as soon as we're notified of the call that's coming in to us from the black. No, no, you, you, you start the out of shoot process as soon as you get the call. And then when that out of shoot process is complete, you know, when they're, 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 eating, they're eating lunch or something, they gotta, you know, they gotta stand up, whatever. I mean, they, they gotta do something to get into the ambulance. So my understanding is that when they get in the ambulance and they leave and they start driving to the the site that's required, you know, the, to, to the response site, that's when the timer is ticking on that response time. You know, our data starts when it's assigned to the truck, when the call is assigned to the truck is when it starts ticking. Okay. So the out of shoot time, if it's elongated, is going to show an elongated response time. And that data has been showing itself. So what's the start of that out of shoot time? When the truck when the truck is assigned the call. Okay. But the, that second call, Mary, and I don't have one of those in front of me, but that second call, the response time is from the end of the hour shoot until. I checked prior to coming here with my data guy, and he said it's the time that the truck is assigned to the time the truck goes on scene. Okay. That's the calculation that's being made. I confirmed that with him today. All right, I would, I would have to go back through. I've got some on my computer, I have to go back through and look at it. But I'll, for a second discussion, I'll take your, your word on that. Okay. So, and just to go back and wrap up about how we ended up getting into a bid situation looking for an ambulance, the actions by East Long Meadow precipitated really bad response times, which caused us to go out looking for our own ambulance. And AMR, back in January 2020, 900,000. The ELS was 500,000. Action was 330. Um, so we're looking at history now. Let's right. look, let's look at moving forward. Well, I'm, okay. just, I'm just trying to go back to what you were talking about to level set where we were then and how we got to where we are today. And so I and, think and we're I, finished this we discussion. Need, I'm, I'm, asked, I'm just saying we need to look at the whole picture, and the whole picture should look back beyond the point where we had where, where AMR was no longer providing service to East Meadow. I don't know that it makes sense because AMR in East Long Meadow, whatever happened before that resulted in us with these response times, so screwed, this screwed, moment of time, screwed. this moment of time was the reason we ended up looking for our own ambulance. What happened prior to this is of no consequence. You're, you're, mixing, you're mixing time frames conveniently to um, bolster your, your position. I don't uh, think for so. Example, for example, so let's you're, just you're, stop. You're, talk, you're, talking, stop that. you're talking about the, you, you, get, you get rough and free reign to, to No, to, all I'm saying is don't tell me I'm mixing time frames. Like, I'm just telling you, explain okay. what it is you're trying to say. Here's a document. I'm trying to explain it. You're talking about, you say we can't look back in history. Well, those quotes that you got there were three years ago. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what quotes will be from ambulance companies right now. This is my response to you talking about East Long Meadow 
and AMR. Okay, then, then money shouldn't have been in that response at all. We were talking about response times. We weren't talking about money in quotes. Well, so you're, you're mixing things to conveniently show your point of view. We're talking, I don't if think we're talking so. about response times, we need to say that historically the response times were acceptable to the town and to the board of selectmen and to the, to the, and to the response team, the, the, the police and fire chief, prior to action ambulance, or uh, excuse me, um, AMR. Discontinuing their service with East Hall Meadow. And then, is, then that precipitated this. I agree with you entirely. Yeah. But I'm just saying that the it whole story is. It was the abysmal response times that precipitated <coughs> the whole, like, seeking bids and ending up where we yeah, are I, I, with action. I, I, so I think you and I are saying the same thing. Okay. All right. So do we move on now? The only other change that why we're on um, section six response time that if there is to be an amendment i would suggest is that all times will be tracked by the hamden police department communication center wilbraham is now dispatch and so yeah wrcc that be yep. an update all right so we're ready to move on to um, currently listed staffing minimums are one paramedic and one EMT. Is that where we are? Yeah. Currently listed staffing minimums are one paramedic and one EMT for all shifts. In an effort to provide more transparency, notifications must be sent to the designee and BOS whenever service levels drop from ALS to BLS with explanation of why within 24 hours of service level change. Any service level below ALS for 24 cumulative hours in a one week period of time on every Sunday is subject to a $500 per incident fine based on review by the designee BOS and the contractor. Mike, is there a way to add to the reporting um, so that we we do have transparency into when we have a drop in service and for what period of time? Yes. There'd be a separate report though. So, so we're getting so many reports here, these are now going to be all different reports. Is what we're going to have to generate. But it's something that we can do on a daily, weekly? Or um, you want to just get back to us on what would work? Yeah. Now, as far as the LDs, <coughs> that is, I don't think that's our purview. I will say that, you know, any any additional costs going into the contract might change our pricing from action. Does anybody have anything to add? I do. No, no, I do have something oh, to add. I thought you said I do. Um, I agree with the first sentence. That we need to have a active reporting when this happens. We need to go to the board of selectmen. I think the 24 hours is a reasonable time frame. I would say, I would, but I would say within one business day, um, rather than 24, 24 hours. Um, but it, because the, you know, if it's going to the board of selectmen, they're they're not meeting. You know, I, I just think a business day would be a more reasonable one. Um, the second part about finding uh, when there is a uh, when a threshold of uh, non-contracted services is reached, uh, I am not in agreement with that. Um, I think that by throwing this out there and saying that there's if there's 24-hour level service uh, service change within um, one week period is setting a minimum threshold that's acceptable. The contract language currently says 24-7 ALS. I've heard various discussion points on this. Um, for Well, you know, even if a BLS responds, you'll, you'll get transported to the hospital. Well, if a BLS responds to an ALS needed call, you may be transporting, transporting a corpse to the hospital, not the patient. And I think that the Board of Selectmen has been extremely remiss it's been almost six months that we've been getting BLS service. Um, and this is within our purview because our purview is quality, okay? 
uh, that we've been getting BLS service almost on a weekly basis for one or two shifts. And the Board of Selectmen is remiss in not bringing this, not having it at a meeting, not asking the action ambulance to come in to a Board of Selectmen meeting, explain it, give them an action plan for fixing it, and living up to the contract. Um, there is a already a uh, element in the contract 31, I can't remember what the, uh, the title is, but yeah. Um, the 31, which is the um, recourse and uh, what was breach and remedy. The breach and remedy. Um, there's already a breach and remedy there. Right now, BLS is in breach of the contract, and I think the board of selectmen is remiss in not addressing that. Let's look at a theoretical situation. Let's say action responds with a BLS, and a very unfortunate situation happens, and that patient dies in route because there's not any ALS services available in that action in that ambulance. Hamden, I believe, is liable at that point in time because we have a contract that we're not enforcing for 24-7 BLS, and your average ambulance chaser lawyer would have a fun time with that to say, hey, look, at Hamden wasn't even enforcing that level of the contract. You got responded, you know, your relative was responded to a BLS service, required an ALS response. Um, I, I, I just have trouble with accepting anything other than what's in the contract. And I don't have an issue with the fact that there's been challenges in the industry and, and, um, and uh, you know, that, that some things happened back in September that caused a problem. That was back in September. That problem hasn't been resolved. Um, I'm not willing to give that flexibility. Um, so I, I, I personally don't want that second sentence in there. Um, the only thing that I'll say is typically any ambulance contract when there are penalty clauses in contracts, when you go from small systems to large systems, um, providers factor penalty into the cost of the system. So we can definitely have the conversation and then talk about pricing as well. And I'd also like to add that if you look at Section 18, you know, what's going on nationally and statewide, there's plenty of documentation that, um, you know, you could use to substantiate force majeure, state of emergency, or whatever. And um, this enables the contractor, if the contractor incurs costs for emergency protective measure, measures, additional staffing, equipment, training, and management that extend over and above beyond, beyond the cost of normal operation of this agreement. With that in mind, the contractor respectfully requests that the town reasonably cooperate with the contractor in every effort the contractor undertakes to recover unforeseen costs. And this pandemic and national paramedic shortage is certainly an unforeseen event. And I think there's plenty of documentation out in the world, including at the Mass Municipal Association to substantiate that. So all I'm saying is in response to what you're saying, there's a flip side where our contractor could come back at us looking for resources. I don't believe that. Well, I, 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 I believe what you're saying. It, 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 it may be enforced in other situations. I don't think it's relevant in this situation. Um, there's a contract. Um, provide services and it's not being provided and if you say that this was something that they need more money in order to do that then that flies in the face of the three percent increase that we were offered for the next two potential extensions what i'm saying is if you're trying to assess damages one way there's a flip side possibility of that even the national pmp -E i guess we're up with ebt uh, EMTP shortage and where salaries are increasing to onboard people that their costs have gone up and it is possible that you know there yeah, is a flip yeah, yeah, and it might be an I, I increase you, in what, our pricing. I hear what so, you're saying but apparently it's not because they're offering us an increase at three uh, extension at three percent if they said came back to the town and said you know we can hire those individuals 
that we need in order to find 24-7 ALS, but in, in order to do so, we need a different value. I think that's a reasonable discussion for them to have with the board of selectmen. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, 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 I don't think it's reasonable to us, it's, it's to create a um, threshold of this is the amount of time every week that BLS is acceptable. And that's what that's what the second sentence does. Can I, can I go back to your example? So I think it would be pretty hard to say that we should be able to find the ALS responded first could very well die Agreed. as well. And it would be a pretty hard pressed in court to prove something like that. And I if there is a a BLS response, I mean, do you have how how long before an ALS is on site? Isn't it that mutual aid would roll an yeah. ALS? That's what so, that is. Yeah. So it if, wouldn't if, be if a, if a mutual aid ALS is available. But if, if there's a BLS ambulance at the staging point in Hampton and a minute away there's a there's a, a situation where you know they could have responded in a minute or two, but somebody has to come from East Long Meadow and it's a it's a ten minute response and the person dies because there was no ALS in Hampton when it there could when not not under the circumstance where they were called out by mutual aid, et cetera, right? or another call, I understand that. But that's a situation where the selectmen, and I believe they're remiss in this, have not had Action Ambulance in to read the Riot Act and say, listen, you're not meeting the obligations of your contract. And your whole thing about numbers, I, I understand. It makes sense logically. But then if you're going to apply logic, apply logic to the whole equation. Mm -hmm. Because if they, why, why would they come back to the town and say, we can give you an extension for 3% when you're saying, well, they can't. They can't do it at three percent. They can't do it the money they're getting. I never said they couldn't do it. All I'm saying is, if you you're, open you're up the door we, you're, you're to go we, one way, you open we, it up equally to go the you're, other you're way. You're saying if we hold them responsible and we ask for, and we did not talk about the board of selectmen because they have no authority here. I, I'll make that clear throughout my conversation. Um, we recommended the board of selectmen that they should be enforcing the contract. And the provider comes back with what you're saying is the potential of, well, we can't afford that because of what's going on. That flies in the face of what they just offered to the town. What I'm saying is, if you're going to add cost, right? No, we're not adding cost. A, we're, we're saying you're we, adding we're if, we're if you're adding we're saying, we're damages. Saying, we're saying, you're no, adding no, we're, cost. No, it's just no, the nature saying, of no, contracting, they're, pure they're, and simple. They're subtracting yeah. value. Yeah. You're not. You're, you're looking at a one. You're looking at a one-sided coin. There. Jim, um, how do I put this? Um, I'm a very good reason why ALS might not be available is because they're obligated to respond if another town calls. We have, there's that's a lot the of things. That's in, the, that's in the contract. That is, there's a lot of things I'm that talking about, are. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about when they stage ELS personnel where, and, and, and equipment where they should be staging ALS. And, and there's been at least two occurrences per week for the last six months. Okay, on, on average, I understand that their fluctuations, and it didn't get better by 40% in January. No. Mike, are you fully staffed ALS now with the new hires? They're coming on board, so they're actually doing all their orientation time. We've got nine people that are upgrading or come along. So when will you be fully staffed? So it's going to be within the next week or so. That's how close we are. So I say that not to change anything and to give actions as they have made such an effort to get fully staffed due to uncontrolled situation that was not that way at the beginning of the contract. They were 24-7 ALS, I believe, when we first started. Yes. And through COVID and the, the takeover at Holyoke, all those are beyond control of their control, and they've made every effort to provide us Absolutely what, what great service. They just hired more people. They've recruited this is six, more this paramedics. Is six, this is six months after. You're occurred. in a national shortage of paramedics. Our, our job is not to. Our exactly. Job, our, job is to look, our job is to look at quality. And the fundamental element of quality is the 
fulfillment of the contractual obligation. And so, the job is also to look at the whys of the impact. No, it's not. And yes, it's, it is. No, it's it's not. all part of contract it, it, management. It, it, we it, had it, no impact. We had no person have 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 any negative outcomes. That's not for the point. Our, but 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 it is because they have been able to maintain quality service their entire their entire time. Have you been to the hospital the system? Is yeah. Have you been? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's it's a rat race. Everybody's short. Like I mean, I just I don't know how you're so stuck on this one on this one thing when it's going to be over in the next month. And they'll because be, we were told it was going to be over in November, and it's not over yet. And it's February, almost March. That's and we've why. been through crisis. Uh, they went job, through a huge well, crisis. Our job is not to defend non-compliance with a contract. Our job is to look at quality and. Uh, Compliance with the contract is a fundamental piece of the quality, and, and uh, it's not there. Uh, uh, I, I've well, made it my, will I've be there. I, I would just be, say that the, my the larger, well, thank you, because the larger system, you know, if we're talking patient care at the end of the day, that's what matters. People live or die by the quality that is being provided. Right. And the People service and the system is working. So, so, don't, so don't use... Don't use words and concepts in one direction and not in the other direction. I can agree, and Mike has agreed to provide us reporting when um, BLS is in play versus ALS. Then I think it's reasonable to look to see the whys of that and to go forward from there. You know, how fast did they remedy? What, what was the cause? How fast did they remedy? And then the board can take steps from there. We that, start with that's, the that's what, I, that's what I said. I said I, I believe that the report should be made. I thought one business day was uh, acceptable instead of 24 hours. Um, but I'll go with 24 hours if, if you agree. 24 hours in a week is what we have. This is no, no, 24 hour report on the report. Threshold. You said you, you didn't say the board of selectmen to report in, within 24 hours? Well, I think you're. To an explanation to come to the board of second within 24 hours of, of the service change. That's what's in, in the so language. Mike, from, is that what you can deliver or what business days? Well, it, you know, you have to look at the business days as because of weekend and stuff too. So, how do you want to handle weekend days as part of this? Either as business days? Uh, to me, a business day is, you know, Monday through Friday, Friday, excluding holidays, and, which is fine. Yeah. You know, so 24 hours within that business day. So, so, so within one business day. So if the business day ends at midnight, the report should be received before midnight the next day. So the way we run it is it ends in that morning. So at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. depends on the truck is a shift change. That's when a change takes place. So what we're saying is the next business day of that event. Yes. So if it, if it happens, because, because here's the thing, that the event will end or terminate 12 or 24 hours after, so it's after that 24 hours. It's after the end of, of the, the end of the shift. Got it. When the clock ticks. Yep. Okay. The end of the shift. Yep. So it could be. Yeah, and that's the thing that we need to um, make sure that we're clear about. No, I don't think we need to. I think, you know, we, we might amend the contract to add the reporting and other standards and controls to just add a new report. I agree. But, you know, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's fair. We're agreeing to that. that so we agree if to there it. is an amendment to the contract, that that should be included. As far as LDs and all this other stuff, that's up to the board. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yes, yes. I just want to write this down. So we're we're, we're agreeing we? to amend. Um, we're not voting on this. We're just having some verbal agreements. I said that uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. As we, we just, you know, the selectmen can listen to this whole thing if they want. Yeah. Um, well, they're here. So. <laughs> Um, yes. So I, you know, I, I agree that uh, to put amended language in the contract for reporting when there is. Uh, yeah, the if we're going to amend the contract, add okay. it. If yep. if there's a decision made that you're going to change the date and the time period, 
then you know I would caution and then you get to retract it at all. If that's not our thing, I know, I'm just saying we already we already gave them our decision, but once you open something up. Well, it, it can go the other way too. So. Absolutely. All right, so amended section to include the training of first responder EMT and add paramedic level certifications to Hamden Fire and Police personnel at no cost to the town. I gave you guys a handout. Paramedic, and Mike, I hope you can address this because I can't. Um, paramedic total hour training is 10,072. As best as I can, 1,072 hours. As best as I can determine, uh, the cost of paramedic program is somewhere between seventeen and twenty thousand dollars per person, and if the um, the the churn of employees is what it seems to look like at the fire department or wherever, um, I think it's an expense that, first of all, is pretty expensive for the town, and I I don't know how you feel about adding that, but. I think it's a, a it's ridiculous ask. Well, it's, the other thing I'll say is that it's seventeen to twenty thousand dollars for the education component alone. Mm -hmm. That that's the tuition for the program. That doesn't include cost and travel time to clinical sites, okay. um, to hospital clinical sites, um, so ICU, ER, IV therapy, uh, OR. Um, also, field internship and writing time with uh, EMS providers to be a clinical time as well. So I don't know if the town is going to pay their staff to go do all that clinical time. We can also tell you that there's a 50% attrition rate for people that staff these programs to actually complete them as well. So you will have a 50% attrition rate where you'll have a student enter the program, the tuition costs will be on, on, will be on, and they won't finish the program as well. So. Um, before the town wants us to agree to this, I understand that this is an extremely expensive endeavor. Um, I can tell you I have right here, this cardiac monitor they brought tonight is $40,000. If you run an ALS truck, you need to buy two of them because you need a backup in case the front one goes down. So you need all of that training to understand how to run this device and everything it does. Cardioversion, defibrillation, pacemaker, and tidal CO2 and a number of other functions, and that's what the training is all about. So ultimately, the cost borne to do this and provide this training is significant, very significant. I will also detail this back to the problem with the shortage of paramedics is because of the cost to do these types of programs. You can't, manuf it takes 16 to 18 to 24 months to fulfill this program. It is not something that you do within six months, like a part-time EMT program that is essentially 110 to 140 hours of training. Okay, this is enormous, and this is then the town needs to discuss what they want to do from this training perspective. If you want us to undertake this type of training, we will have our own paramedic program up and running within the next 30 to 60 days. That's why I spent my day today finalizing with the accreditation agency to help with the staffing shortage. However, our cost of doing it is that cost to even train our staff to do it. I would, uh, I would, so it's I would agree that adding something that significant to the contract and not expecting to uh, have cost increases would be unreasonable. And I would say it shouldn't be part of any extension. You know, the other. Uh, problem you have is that once you've trained paramedics they're hard to keep exactly uh, that's the churn I was I, uh, I served in Norfolk Mass as the town manager and they ran the ambulance service through the fire department and the last uh, time we did that we trained three people they graduated one went to North Carolina one went to a wealthy suburb of Boston and we kept one so wow. Uh, we had to amend the contract to require. That's not bad. Huh? Batting, batting 330. I know. Well, we had to amend the contract uh, uh, to say that if you leave before three years, you've got to pay back the cost of, of, of the training. Yeah. So, 
So I also want to know that the training option um, has been in the contract for almost two years now. Do we know how many personnel have, Mike, have, have you trained any Hamden police, fire, so Ed? Have you, has anybody availed themselves of the training that's currently available? Want me to answer that, Mike? Sure. Um, we have the CDR class um, once the research by our firefighters and some first responders. We had a few people take the EMP course, but I guess there's something that happened within action that the class, the instructor left. Again, I, I don't know the full story. Um, but we had three people take that class and for some reason it was um, instructor left and it turned to Zoom or something. And, and, uh, they finished it, but it was, it was a little bit of a, I, I'm sure it's ironed out now. Um, yeah, so Chief, I think probably five months ago we met with you and Chief, uh, Police Chief about training. Mm -hmm. uh, your yep. deputy was present as well, yep. and we talked through all of this. And uh, I had asked the deputy to reach out to me about anybody that needed uh, uh, this PD specifically was fine. Uh, the chief said he was fine from a training perspective on his own. I had asked your deputy to reach out to me about any additional training that we needed done, yep. whether it was recertification training, initial training, first responder training. CPR training or anything like that. And I have not heard back from the deputy. Um, I was at a meeting with him. I believe he was in East Long Meadow with you as well. I reiterated uh, that conversation with him. Please follow up with me about any training that he might want done. And I haven't heard back at this point. Yeah, your EMT school, is it close by now or is it your? So we run the program remote, but we run it from through the entire state. So we go as far as Pittsfield for on-site stuff and stuff in Wilmington and everything in between. So we have all those options available. So at, at some point there'll be some hands-on learning. Where where would that take place? We bring it on site for you guys. You would bring it on site. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because I know that was a hardship the last time they had to travel out east or something for it. I think it discouraged a few people. That's good to know. Okay, standards and controls, we're back around to calculation of uh, response time not being calculated by out of shoot to arrival, but from time of dispatch to arrival time for more transparency. Response time is defined in section six is from receipt of the call until the ambulance arrival at scene. So again, Mike, you said- So we need, we need clarification, receipt of what call? Is it the receipt of the call at the wreck, or is it the receipt of the call to action? Well, how do you know when the wreck receives a call if you don't receive one? Well, I, I get I mean, that. I, I, so, so some systems want it from the initial call. Some systems it would be from when we're notified, right? So would so that have require to, we would have coordination to, with correct. Wilbraham? Correct. Is that a doable thing, or is I don't know. I'd have to ask. Then we'd have to make a change. Because Correct. You know, there's no way that they, they can't start going to a call. They don't even know about it. Or they're exactly. not assigned to it. So from, from a, a process perspective, I'm certified in EMD, which is the emergency medical dispatch stuff. There are times that the caller is prolonged mm -hmm. on the phone before a resource is sent. Yep. Because of resources, mm -hmm. go through the protocol. It's more important to go through mm -hmm. the protocol first. Yep. So it's not always an accurate or a good representation of system response because other life-saving maneuvers are being done on the phone first before resources are sent. So how we do this opens Pandora's box about reporting. Uh, may may I make a suggestion? Sure. Um, I, I know they're asking you to do a lot of reports. I, I'm sitting here and I need a report for this or a report for that. I, I get that. So how about if we just ask Central to provide the report for the times that way, or, I mean, I think that's what we're getting at. But how do they know I mean, when they arrive? Or do they know when they arrive? Well, they know, they have to call on scene, the PD calls on scene, we call on scene, everybody knows when everybody arrives. So I think, I think what's happening to Jim's um, concern 
and I, this is just a suggestion, mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want. But I, I think what's happening is, is when action enters there, assigns that ambulance to that call, would be possibly the only error that could be created in my, you know, what I'm saying. And it could be when the dispatcher enters the screen as A1 um, going, going to the call. But that, that's it. So if, if we got when dispatch, you know, called in action to, to go to the call, then they would enter that time. Once action says we're on scene, then they'll have that time. That would be the actual in route time, in my opinion. I think that's what Jim was referring to. I don't know. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. I'm referring to. I'm looking at a, a report from ten. Uh, so my and, over, and, October. And I don't even know if Tony's. My only concern is that. this: is what we have learned through this entire process is there's a number of human errors that take place in the data, and until you can find a way to verify that data being accurate, then the data is not good. As we, this exercise that we've gone through and working with the committee has been very valuable on that front. Um, so, you, so you're against, you're against I'm not against it. My, my issue is how do you verify that the times coming from the record are human error free? I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I think it's going to, I'm saying both ways. It could happen both ways. Where there, where I guess actions assign time to go to the emergency call. But REC is assigned, that's their job, is to keep track of those times and that call. But I'm, I'm just it. saying, again, it's just a suggestion. And, and all what we're finding, and my only point is, and I'm not trying not, to say, not all the data is accurate. I'm sorry, I should, I, should, I should retrace my steps. I'm not trying to say we use this against your contract. It's not, I'm just saying, if someone's concerned if the times are not accurate, this is a way for them to check, maybe? I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm just trying to facilitate it. I think it's and an interesting exercise. Because, <laughs> um, because Tony has our GPS system. We've given him access to yep. that, so he can track the truck. He can look at that, so he has the potential to do data yeah. verification as yeah. well. So collaborating with him on this, I'm open to doing that. I just want to make sure that the data is being is active because human beings make mistakes. And they're making mistakes not intentionally. It's because they have other things going on simultaneously and they have limited people to to do those things. That's all. And I'm not faulting them for it. I'm not even faulting my staff for it. But what we've learned going down this journey is that these things happen and you have to spend time and effort to go back, retrace steps to verify act, data accuracies and inaccuracies. That's all. It would be fairly accurate to track the time you get the call that you're actually dispatched. The ambulance gets the call, not the time the wreck gets the call and dispatches the ambulance. Right. So from the out of shoe, as soon as you get the call and then you arrive on the scene, those are have limited error, correct? Where you get the call. Yes, and then you're just we we have limited error because we're validating that data. Yep, and right. then so you're saying that the rec can get a call and, and they can be at times, like you said, giving life saving. Yeah, emergency medical dispatch. They're they're trained. One of the reasons why we consolidated with Wilbraham yes. is that we had one dispatcher at the console. Wilbraham has a, a team, yeah, and so they can conduct emergency medical dispatch which is also a, co a contributor to saving lives. Yes. And uh, uh, that'll sometimes take a few minutes. And that has, they have a protocol that they have to yeah, follow. Yeah, they do, legally. So I think, in all due respect, that, that the way it is now is, is the most accurate and fair way to judge response time. When eliminating that variable and just going from when the, the ambulance is actually told they have a call or dis dispatch and they get to the scene. That is a fair way. That is their response time. I mean, if there's a, a, an extended, uh, there are other situations that are beyond anybody's control and they they don't, you know, that's my opinion. So can I ask a question? Because I'm peeking at Jim's laptop here and, and mine. The first column in the report after the address is dispatch time. Is there likely to be an consistency or human error factor or whatever in that dispatch time as compared to what Wilbraham would have? It's possible for human error. 
It is. That's what we're finding out. So what we're doing is we're going back and we're listening to tape that's date and time stamp. We're looking at when the truck turns on. So when the truck turns on, the GPS system lights up. It goes from you know um, a, a grayed out to a green. When this truck starts moving, is then we know we can calculate that out of shoot time. That's how we're doing it. When the truck stops at the scene, we know that they've arrived. So we're supporting our system through technology, through the GPS system, to get more accurate and up-to-date data. So the dispatch time in this report is when you receive the call and the truck turns on? When we receive the call. With the call, right. Sorry. Any comments, questions? No, I, I look back at a, a report and um, the, the reference in here to, to using the auto shoot, the auto shoot time, not, not it's referencing the annual report, yearly report, not this monthly report. The monthly report, and Michael is correct in what he said earlier, it's, uh, you know, I'm looking one that uh, 1621.42 was the dispatching route was 1622.47, which is, now you start using fraction decimals instead of seconds, the it's, database it's a little over a minute, 1.08. Um, which is which is correct, and then it arrived at 1640, 1630.09, um, which would be just under nine minutes, which is 8.45. So you're correct that 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 at least in this, I didn't look at the annual report that Craig is referencing, but uh, you're you're correct on that. So are we saying this is a non-issue? I, I don't know what is in the annual report. Uh, that's that's what the yearly report. I have to see if I have that on the computer. So in terms of report modifications for time of dispatch and all that, this is a non-issue, not applicable, right? Okay, so moving on. We need more effort from the contractor report on all calls over 10 minutes to the list of designees and BOS. 43 times in calendar year 22, the response to 10 minutes or greater was noted in the yearly report by action. And um, just to note that 43 calls out of 673 is 6.38%. We don't know the details of that. Mike, did you go back and look yep. at those 43, or are you in the process of that to see? The bulk of them are data error problems. And, and the problem that we have our GPS system, it only tracks the data back so far. I think it's 60, 70 days. So we can't go back beyond that to go back and verify with the GPS system. It doesn't allow, it doesn't store the data that long. So we can't go back and check those. But what we did do is in that, in Q4 of 22, as we went through all these exercises to set up the system to now nail this down to understand the reasons why the data variances were, were there. And now that we're a year to date with one response time over 10 minutes, we think that it's more of a data error problem than a system function problem based upon what we're realizing. Because we've got one, one time in 40, 45 days, and we have a handle on it where it was coming from coming out of Springfield, coming back to town. So, that one 10 minute uh, response was coming from Springfield? Coming from Springfield after after dropping the patient from the system off to the hospital, it was coming back into the system. And that's why it was extended. Okay. So that's the system one? Yeah, the data validation side of it is showing tremendous. So, so what, like I said, what we've learned here is I'm concerned about other people's data because I don't know what validation process that's on that's working or that's being done. Because it's labor intensive, it's very labor intensive. Our overnight dispatchers spend a couple of hours every night going through all this data, looking at GPS, like checking recordings on the phone system or radio transmissions at a date and time stamp to, to they're essentially putting the, piece, the pieces of the puzzle together through that validation process and using those tools to do it. So would you expect for 2023 into 2024 that at the end of the year we have a much lower um, than 6.38% of calls greater than 10 minutes once the data is validated and all of that, particularly given that you had one instance that was explainable in 45 days? Yeah. The first 45 days shows the system we work. Absolutely. 
I, I, would, I would suggest that this comment uh, made by uh, Selectman Rivers was um, needs more effort from the contractor to report on this. Yeah, we didn't get that far yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, regarding the reporting that should come daily, you know, in addition to the other report, yeah. can you ensure that within that 24 hour period, and let's just nail down our distribution, it would be our town administrator, the BOS, police chief, and fire chief be added. Is there anybody else? To that yeah, I, distribution. I get them. I distribute them around. Uh, do you distribute them? I thought you put them in a repository. Well, I do. I keep that too. But I mean, oh, so I, you're uh, distributing yeah. them. I mean, if there's anything that doesn't get to the selectmen, I make sure they get it. Okay. Put that way. Well, I, I, think question, I have a question though. Who decides whether the transport goes to wing or whether it goes to the, down to Bay State? It's typically the patient. Yeah, the patient. Oh, the patient. The patient. And what's what's the time difference between wing and, and Bay State? Um, it depends where you are in town, is a good point, right? Oh, yeah, so if yeah, you're on the other yeah. side, of the right? Yeah, okay. Now, protocols cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, airway problems that can't be managed, it's the closest hospital based upon geography. Mm. We're required to take the patient, but yeah. if it's a stable patient that can make the trip, it's typically where the PCP or the specialist is in that particular system. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, um, you're committing to making sure these greater than 10 minutes are reported within the 24 hours, right? Yes. Because I have to yeah. say that Ashley's been a little bit missing that regard. Okay. Um, you know, if you, do we need to update? Do you have the email distribution? If we're just giving you, like, town administrator, the three board selectors, the district, the fire chief, or do you need us to send you the email address? I have a fire chief, I have a police chief, I have Bob's, uh, I don't know how you do the BOS email. If it's, is it an email group or is it an individual? I just have a distribution list. Can we just email, just make it simple and give it to Bob and he'll distribute yeah, I, I do that. I, mean, I, I you now. Actually, I now receive reports from you, at least it has your email address. Yeah. So. Well, that wasn't written. the case a couple months ago. No, what's happening is that's part of the review process, so I'm making sure the review process is being done. That's why it's coming later in the day. Before it was automated, we weren't able to get the verification done. It's coming later in the day, which we need the extra time to do that. Because um, it was almost coming out at 7 a.m., so not yeah. everything was verified. So that's why I'm pushing them to you now. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not a reflection on you. It's the position. It's a, It's... The town administrator is not here 24 7. Uh, you know, yeah. whoever's in that position, Bob, Correct. vacation does yeah. these things. Yeah. If we're using that as a distribution channel, I think that's a weak point. I would prefer to see it go to all individuals. Well, it takes the middleman out of the equation, and then nobody can say they didn't. Get it. Well, that's okay with me. I, I can tell you that uh, I look at email every day of the week, including Saturdays and Sundays, multiple times. And I do it because if you don't, it, it accumulates yeah. and you have an overwhelming burden on Monday morning. So if I see that, something, pardon? I push that email to you Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday yep. night yep. <laughs> as well. Okay, so are we agreeing that the distribution is going to include all these entities, one, two, three, six I, I, people? I would agree. I, I think so. Okay. We'll get you those email addresses, Mike. Thanks. Okay, response time. See okay, notes. so the solution that was to BOS individuals. Town administrator, BOS individual, police chief. Police chief. Fire chief. Okay, what did we have for section response time? See section four amendment. We are, I think we already did that. Right? Oh, no, I yeah. want to go back to the needs more effort uh, from the contract to report on call over 10 minutes. Um, we, we, I, we just discussed what it was going to, so I, I, I guess that addressed that issue. Um, that you know that that in the past that apparently was not going out to all these individuals. And was, I, you know, I, I, did you get all of these reports? That, are, you, are you are you consistently getting reports when when I just want to I guess I, I, no, I don't I don't get any though. I just get quarterly reports. Okay. 
So uh, you have not been on the distribution list for uh, any kind of ad hoc reports where it's been more than 10 minutes. Um, I, I have not. I don't, I don't know if the police chief was getting over. I have not, I have not received it. Oh, okay, so, so we, we just we, remedied we, that. Yeah, we so remedied that. All right, great. Okay. Okay. So section six respond time, C above notes in section four. Did we? I think we did all that already. Yeah, but section four. This is where we talked about the changes. Um, the fire chief should be changed to police chief and Wilbraham Regional Emergency Communication Center should replace Camden Dispatch. Personnel, subsections D, E, and F are the same as in section one amendments, minimum personnel standards and provide first responder EMT to paramedic level training for town hand and fire uh, police personnel at no additional cost to the town. I think we beat that dead horse um, and uh, it's just an unreasonable request. Add amendment that the contractor must notify the designee and BOS immediately upon disciplinary infractions, personnel suspensions, Termination or any other unprofessional conduct by an action employee while on duty in the town of Hamden. If you look at page 1C of the existing contract, during the term of this agreement, contractor shall operate an ambulance service licensed by the Office of Emergency Medical Services of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and shall provide advanced life support. The town shall be immediately notified of any suspension, revocation, or denial of licensure and in any events or circumstance that prevent the ambulance service from providing the agreement, providing the agreed upon ambulance services. So I think that comment is more, more covered. Agree? Agree? Okay, that gets us to backup service. I think this is the last one. Add amendment that lists HFD as backup service to Action Ambulance Monday through Friday, H4, at HFD is secondary backup service in the event Action can not provide a backup in off hours and weekends. I think we've already discussed this at the outset and it's not our purview, um, or it's not the purview of the Ambulance Committee or the scope of this contract. So, I would just like to add something to that if I can, because there was a, you know, um, Robin's opening comments were very, uh, very um, passionate. And I, I, you know, I, I hear your passion, but I, I, I do have a different opinion, and I just want, now this is going out to the public, so I want, I want to know that I share a different opinion, but this is, I agree that this is not the venue for that discussion. Okay. So, anybody have anything else to say, or do we have a motion to adjourn? Um, there were uh, comments by um, Southern Dan Report. Do we? The, the, that's, in, that's in the packet that I handed out. Are, are there any of these in fact that we agreed upon? I, I didn't get this until. I read it earlier, and I think um, a lot of it covers or is his opinion regarding the police chief and fire chief. Yeah, um, it And so I think we offered our opinion on that, and I don't think there's anything more to say about that. But I do have a curiosity question. My guess is suitcase over there. I'm curious to know if it's in that. <laughs> Just so the committee knows. So this is actually the drug box that the paramedics carry. So the thousand plus hours of training that we go through is really centered upon this cardiac monitor, the drug box, and these are what we call controlled substances which are strictly regulated by food and drug at the state level and federal level. And can only be, and all of this can only be issued through pharmacies at the hospitals that we have agreements with. So that's really the big difference. So we have drugs here. I can open up your lungs. I can slow your heart rate down to nothing. I can speed it up really quickly. I can wake you up if you're unconscious as a diabetic. This is done intravenously. This can be done intraosseous where we can drill into the bone in people now to do things to gain access. Um, so. This is all part of that overall training. Now the problem with this is that this requires a whole level of additional oversight as a service. If I was to give this box to someone in this room to walk out the door with, that would be violating federal law because this is all regulated by the federal government. And I was going to ask you to go home. Not allowed. The, the only reason I have it is because um, it being in a position that amendment I'm allowed to, to essentially distribute these medications as a paramedic. But, 
nobody else is allowed to even you know, have the co combination to the lock that goes on this box. So um, everything needs to be logged, so you need oversight. Now the challenge with all of this is, is by giving all these medications and all the things that happen, you need a very strict clinical oversight of continuous quality improvement program or quality assurance program to make sure what's going on on a day in and day out basis is appropriate in meeting the protocols. You also need physician oversight. So we have a physician that we pay that's on staff for us, who's a board certified emergency room physician uh, that oversees all the clinical performance of our paramedics. Uh, and that physician interfaces with the physicians in the different emergency rooms that we can take to. We get our medical control and material out of AC. So Dr. Stanberry will interface with the physicians at Bay State for um, um, and for, from an oversight perspective. And then we do reporting into those hospitals as well, just like we do reporting to you. We supply clinical reports to the hospitals uh, to show what's going on within the system. So we have to have a very um, extensive behind the scenes network of people to support all the regulatory oversight that goes along with all of this. So it's a, it's a complicated model altogether. How, um, what's your competency program So the challenge with paramedics, and part of the problem that we're dealing with the, the shortage is, um, every two years we need to recertify. Okay. And so we have to do um, online classes, in-person classes, we have to do uh, monthly m and rounds with the physicians who do cases, difficult cases, trends that we see within the, within the industry, within healthcare itself. Because it, as people know, healthcare evolves. What we did 10 years ago is not the same as we do today. So the medications that we carry change all the time. The protocols at the state level change every 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 year. The new protocols start, uh, the state just issued will start from April first of this year. So now we're responsible for training all of our staff for those new protocols as well. So that they have to come up to speed. We end up having to take drugs out of the drug box and sometimes we put new drugs in. So it's a constant um, evolution of change. It's it's a lot of behind the scenes work and it's a lot of we have some drug doses in here that are $300 a dose. You know, and we got two to six doses of some of those drugs in here. So the box is very, very expensive. What's well. the, where you think the price tag on that is? On the box itself? Um, on the box with its content. The content. With the content. Well, yeah, the content and everything. Probably about six to $7,000. Yeah. Uh, we carry ketamine now. So ketamine is one of the most powerful tranquilizers out there right now that we're using to facilitate these procedures. Um, and I feel that's a new medication for us that the, the, the ER physicians have granted us practice. We practice under the license of the physician and the emergency room that's on duty. We are not allowed to just go out and practice on our own. So we have to have very, um, we have very complex medical control and oversight agreements with the hospitals to delegate that authority to us. We can't do this on our own. We do this under our affiliation agreements with the hospital. So those affiliation agreements are typically reviewed annually as well, um, based upon the data that we're reporting. And then if we have to do corrective action with our, our paramedics, then the physician in the hospital system oversees that as well. Okay. So it's very, very, it's very highly regulated. It's, it's a lot, especially if you're working in healthcare. So we're regulated by DPH, we're regulated by mass food and drug, and then at times, and they are regulated by the FDA, but also food and drug regulates the pharmacies in the hospitals and mass food and drug. So they're required to do these exchanges with us and provide us stuff, but we have to report back to the pharmacy. Ultimately, we report into pharmacy on that side of the medications. Um, don't, don't. Our other he's, he's yeah. yeah. He used to do, he was on a committee about investigating and was telling me, you know, um, incidences and of something else. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. know what they call it, but yeah. that's about as good as I, I can totally appreciate it. So I have a question that I was really not sure. This also is, but pops down to all this, too. Wow. Um, so these are mostly all IV push meds, um, IV kit meds, that done, all the calculations are done by the paramedic. The problem right now that you're seeing is 
paramedics that have the high attrition rate of missing out on the math skills to do the math for medications. That's why the attrition rate is so high, which is contributing to the shortage of paramedics uh, because they don't have the fundamental math skills to get through the medication math. And that's where the problem, that's why, that's part of the problem that we're in, uh, attracting more people because this, the big fundamental skill sets, they can't get to that, uh, which is part of the problem. And it seems like the school are, are, are not doing a good job of fundamental math skills. Do you see like a database or some like handheld device that at some point will let you input, you know, like height, weight, gender, whatever, to do the math for you to get over that? They're there, but they're not, um, they don't have time to get to that point with some of these calls to do some of the math. Oh, they got to do it right in their head. They're doing the head. It's quick. I'll have to like that. It's quick. Yeah. It's very quick. So I have an off-the-wall question. On the news tonight, they were talking about fentanyl coming into our area with that horse tranquilizer called tranquilizer. Yeah. Um, so many different versions. So when you talk about new protocols and everything, would that be something that, like, if, say, for example, that drug is coming into our area, that you guys would have to, like, immediately respond? I mean, I, I don't know what the remedy would be, if it's Narcan or whatever, but is that something that you have to, like, get immediate training to address? Yeah, so there was one point in time a number of years ago that people were overdosing on a combination of fentanyl and cocaine. And what would happen is we would wake them up with Narcan and they would be so combative that we couldn't control them because of the stimulant on the cocaine side. And there were other substances that were mixed in with that. So before we would wake them with the Narcan and we'd control the airway, we'd do some different things to do that, make sure that their saturations were appropriate, they were breathing okay. We would actually give them a tranquilizer and then we would wake them up with the Narcan to protect the first responders. So there's, there's a lot of different there's, factors that go into this. I really appreciate you bringing this to our attention because it's it's not only fascinating, but you can see the complexity of managing something like that. Yeah, we can do, um, we're close to being able to do surgical airways. Wow. You know, surgical cricothyroidomy. Wow. We're doing needle cric right now. The process of training out people to do surgical airways. We can do chest decompression for pneumothorax you know, and cases. There's a lot of stuff, but that's again the training is so complex to get to that point. And it takes so long to train one person to get there. Yeah, well, that sort of elucidates this uh, 1,072 hours that we talked about earlier. And that's the bare minimum. Some programs yeah. will go longer than that. Should I close? You want to close the meeting? I can. Is it motion to end the meeting? So moved. So moved. Second. All right. We're done.